Hi, everyone. It's 11 o'clock here, so let's get started. Uh, thank, everyone, thank you to everyone for joining us today for our webinar. My name is Jackie Carville, and I'll be coordinating the webinar today. I'm here with Matthew Kaiser, who will be going over our gene panel workflows that are new to LaserGene 12. You may have noticed that your phone has been muted. However, we do encourage you to ask questions along the way. To ask a question, just type it into the chat dialog and click Send to Host. I'll then direct these questions to Matt uh, for them to be answered for the whole group. Uh, if you need any assistance or have any questions during the webinar, you can feel free to send a chat message to me, email me at webinars at dnastar.com, or tweet us at the Twitter handle at DNA Star Inc. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Okay, thank you, Jackie. I'll just uh, um, get a PowerPoint set up here for folks. And again, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us on a Friday afternoon. Um, I will be covering some new workflows in uh, the DNA Star Genomics Suite. And I'd like to give a little introduction to the company, as I typically do in webinars. And uh, we'll have a few more slides today to describe uh, some aspects of the workflow. And, uh, and of course, I'll take any questions. You can chat them in. Um, hopefully, I can answer them uh, during the presentation. Uh, if I don't get the, to them uh, during the presentation, I'll certainly email you after. So uh, DNA Star, again, is a company located in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, it actually looks just like this today in Lake Monona. It's a beautiful day here, uh, which is uh, pretty rare. Usually it's uh, either covered with ice or a lot colder in this part of the country. Um, so DNA Star is celebrating our 30th anniversary. So we've been around a long time. Uh, we've got a large customer user base. Uh, some of these old pictures here, you can see our founder, Dr. Fred Blattner, in one of the pictures from 1984. And a couple of the folks, um, uh, some of the programmers, are also uh, still with the company. So we have um, experience that goes back many years, a lot of expertise um, in different areas. And, and we're just kind of proud to uh, announce, you know, in a, in a industry that's tough to stay in business for a long time. You know, we've been around since the, kind of the very start. Uh, so one of the things that, that we want to talk about with, with uh, any NGS uh, data sets are uh, the kind of performance that we can get. And it's, it's really one of the first questions that will come up is, you know, can desktop software um, compete or, or, or perform comparably to uh, software running on a Linux box or on a Linux server? And so we like to show some of the assembly times just to show that, yes, in fact, you know, on a modest computer we can get really nice uh, uh, assembly performance. And, and so this is just a small, uh, uh, some small data sets um, showing the exomes assembling in about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, the panels that we're going to uh, discuss today, ion torrent and alumina, which tend to be very deep, you know, say 500x coverage or more, um, can just take several minutes to assemble. And so if you have a large number of samples, a um, uh, number of panels, um, time starts to matter. If you've got 100 samples and you add that up, um, it's nice to have an assembler that can handle that job in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, we're, we're also going to talk about accuracy. So I've shown assembly times, uh, but really it's the accuracy that you're going to be probably most concerned about over time. And we're going to investigate today a new workflow that is a validation workflow that allows you to really assess the accuracy of your whole process, the targeting, the, uh, the assembly, and the SNP calling. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll discuss that in detail. Um, and look at uh, some other kind of benchmarks. Uh, so, so for these assemblies, uh, uh, relatively basic hardware. Um, as uh, as we move forward and, and computers get more powerful, um, really a more standard even uh, laptop computer is is sufficient for gene panels. So, for instance, I have a, a laptop that's got 16 gigs of RAM and four cores. Um, I have a little bit of extra storage I use up on my network and a scratch disk that we use to process the template files and the query data. Um, on my computer, it's, it's not an external drive, but we swapped out my DVD-ROM drive uh, and put a, a, a one terabyte uh, hard drive in its place. So, so I can do these gene panels you know, on, a, on a very modest computer. Um, another aspect to DNA Star software is the level of support that um, comes with every purchase. So every purchase, um, there's a service plan. That service plan allows you to access uh, reps here, like myself, that can answer questions directly, either through email or phone or WebEx. We also have over 100 videos on our website that cover all different topics, 
including next-gen workflows. And you can see a number of them here are um, some of them that are platform-specific workflows. Um, we can see kind of in the middle an ion torrent AmpliSeq cancer panel. Um, maybe I can highlight that a little bit. Um, so, so if you're working with some of these data sets, uh, you can uh, first thing, place to go is to check out some of the videos and uh, see how to set up assemblies and do some of the downstream analysis. So, uh, so these are a great resource. Of course, we also have um, we also have webinars. Uh, so we have today's webinar. Uh, my colleague Aaron Reynolds will have a webinar in a few weeks that covers some non-next-gen, but some basic uh, um, cloning and primary designing uh, workflows. And we have some archive webinars on all different topics. So again, if you're if you're new to the software, um, I highly encourage you to um, watch the recorded webinars to get some of the really nice details and features in our software. So today we're going to be talking about uh, the laser gene uh, genomic suite. Uh, there's primarily three software programs that we'll be working with. It'll be Seekman Engine for assembly, Seekman Pro for visualizing the assembled data and doing primary SNP analysis, and we'll also look at ArraySTAR for comparing multiple different assemblies. So if I want to compare SNPs from control and cancer or from different individuals, or it could be RNA-seq, ArraySTAR has those sorts of tools. Now we also have other tools that you know, provide uh, things like phylogenetic alignment, so our evolution suite, and we have structural biology um, uh, protein analysis tools. So again, depending on your need, one of these uh, packages or a whole DNA star package that includes everything um, is, is available. So the workflows that we support um, with, with NGS data are pretty wide ranging, uh, ranging anywhere from genome resequencing you know, to gene panels and exomes, to more niche kind of uh, uh, workflows, like we have things like viral integration in the host genomes and metagenomic workflows in miRNA. And then, of course, we have a great set of de novo tools for doing de novo assemblies and genome closure. Um, and so it's really a wide-ranging um, um, kind of functionality, uh, especially if you're doing more than just gene panels. You know, you're going to want a software that allows you to accommodate um, multiple different workflows. So today we're going to be talking about gene panel data sets. And uh, just to give some examples of the, the gene panels that we typically encounter, um, ion torrent amplicite cancer panels, those are a common uh, type of panel uh, that include hotspot and comprehensive. And of course, they're coming out with new panels all the time with new sets of genes. Uh, the comprehensive panel that we'll look at today is um, exon coverage of about a little over 400 cancer genes. And these data sets from ion torrent, uh, the raw data is typically provided as an unaligned BAM file, uh, which is a new format with ion torrent. Um, and we can process that BAM file just as we would a FASTQ file. Uh, and then they usually will provide you with a BED file that specifies the targeted regions and possibly a VCF file that um, describes the location of known or interesting variations you know, in these targeted regions. And so, so kind of three files together um, is typically what you want to start with, um, if, if you can find it. And, and of course, Illumina has, you know, today we'll look at a true site cancer panel. You know, it's uh, 94 genes and there's 284 SNPs. And Illumina differentiates between germline and somatic mutations. Uh, they also produce uh, uh, bed files. Um, sometimes they're called manifest files for Illumina. Um, their data is in a FASTQ format, and they will also have a VCF file. So, so again, similar but not exactly the same as what we get from ion torrent. And then many of you may also be doing uh, custom gene panels, um, and depending on, it might be a small panel targeting one gene like BRCA. It may be uh, a set of genes where you've designed your own, um, your own panel, and you, you've identified genes that are interesting, targeted those genes, um, so in that case, uh, you may not have a bed file. You may just have a gene list or a list of these targeted regions in an Excel sheet. Um, if that's the case, um, uh, we can convert that file you know, over, you know, and it's pretty easy to go from a tab-delimited Excel file to a bed format. Um, likewise, with VCF files, uh, you might not have your SNPs in an official VCF file format. Uh, VCF file is still kind of a new format, and many folks just have their SNPs in an Excel sheet. And again, if that's the case with you, uh, you know, we can help you convert an Excel sheet that has a list of SNPs in it 
uh, to a VCF file. And I believe that we'll also have some uh, tech um, bulletins um, that can that can help people um, do this on their own, uh, um, or or you can just contact DNA Star for assistance with that. So these are the kind of uh, panel data sets that that we're going to use for the demo today. Um, and I'm sure there are more here. I'm just just kind of mentioning the ones that are the most common. There's there's other ones, of course. A little bit more information on on VCF files, which is a ubiquitous uh, format for storing SNP and indel information. And the VCF files come from the sequencing vendors, but they also come from sources like Thousand Genomes or the Exome Variant Server, or just custom. Other software companies will produce them, so uh, so you know they can come from a variety of different sources. Uh, one of the challenges with VCF files is that because they come from a lot of different sources, they may not contain the same kind of information. So you have to have a parser. Uh, we built the parsers in our software. Um, so, so some of them may only contain reference positions, just a list of here are the interesting positions in my genome. Um, other VCF files, like for instance, Thousand Genomes and Exome Variant Server, they contain more database information. So they may have many, many columns of information, allele frequency, um, it might be polyphen scores or OMIM links, and just uh, and there can be a hundred rows of information, you know, in these VCF files. So the way that our software utilizes them is that Seekman Engine will uh, use VCF files up front and use them to supplement the DB SNP SNPs. So you may have all the SNPs at DB SNP that you want to know about, but you may have a VCF file that has some additional SNPs that you want to include in your analysis. So Seekman Engine will will use that during assembly um, to, um, to to add to the SNP report. Downstream in our software in ArrayStar, you can also use VCF files, but they're usually used uh, to import tertiary information. So you may have things like clinical association or um, you know allele frequencies that you want to use to populate a SNP report to help with your analysis. So ArrayStar treats VCF files more in a sense as an annotation file. So so we can get a lot of different use out of this file format. We'll, I'll show you how how that's done. Um, and of course, both our programs in version 12 can can create, take a, a SNP table, and export out a VCF format. Uh, a little bit uh, more on the bed and manifest files. So these are uh, tad limited files that just define the targeted regions um, uh, in your gene panel. And what's really nice about having these uh, bed files is that you can use them to filter against. So when you're doing the analysis, um, there's going to be plenty of, of, of reads that actually align outside your intended targets. And so you want to be able to distinguish between data that's aligned outside the target versus data that is inside the intended target regions. And you, and you can use bed files then as a filter. You can also use it to analyze the effectiveness of the targeting to make sure that your targeting was specific, that you weren't, uh, for example, amplifying a bunch of pseudogenes, and a lot of your data actually um, was diffused out to pseudogenes. So we'll look at some of the reports where we can do that kind of an analysis, kind of a quality control in the targeting itself. Um, these are, uh, uh, I call them obtuse file formats. Uh, they've, they, they can vary quite a bit. Ion Torrent and Illumina have uh, standardized them quite a bit, but we still see bed files that have different headers, and you know they can be a little bit finicky to work with. Um, and, and this is something that you know uh, we can help you with at DNA Star. If you have a bed file or just a list in an Excel sheet, you know we can convert that file and, and, and incorporate it into the analysis stream. So today we're going to be talking about uh, gene panel workflows. And we have this uh, schematic um, because all gene panel workflows aren't the same, and and so uh, so it's nice to have kind of a schematic to figure out how we use the data um, and whether or not we use bed files or VCF files for different workflows. So um, so it's kind of a decision tree. One of the first things that you ask is, do I have control data? And in many cases, there is no control data, so it's just a straightforward load the sample data, um, load a bed file and a VCF file, and start doing your analysis. So that's the, the, the first kind of workflow here is, is the most straightforward. Um, but if you have control data, then the question is, you know, what, what kind of, con you know, what do I mean by control? Um, is it a control in the sense that it is a set of SNPs that I know that are verified in my sample? And so you might have uh, SNPs that you verified with Sanger data in a data set, and you want to see that, do you detect these same SNPs? Can you validate your process with ion torrent or Illumina? 
Um, and so you might want to know, how accurate am I? Am I detecting all the SNPs in this sample? In that case, that's a validation type control. And so our um, version 12 software allows us to set up a validation report. And so that is a workflow then that uh, we load sample data, control data that will have its own VCF file of verified SNPs, and we can run a validation report that will determine things like sensitivity and specificity, and from that we'll get accuracy measurements and true positives and false positives and so forth. So this is a, if you're, especially if you're moving towards this uh, kind of a, a workflow, having some way to validate your process to know that your targeting is effective and uh, you're, you're picking up all the variations you know, with the assembler and with the SNPs and the uh, analysis and filtering that you're doing. So if you haven't thought about this yet, this is something you definitely want to think about, you know, how you're going to validate this process. Uh, we have some uh, additional ways that we can help with that. We're going to look at a control data set um, from the, the genome in a bottle, which is a gold standard data set that we use to calibrate our software. It might be something that you incorporate as well. Um, and then we may have a control run with you know, sample data as well. So we'll look at uh, this kind of workflow uh, with the validation. Then there's also a control uh, in a cancer data set uh, where we have normal tissue and tumor tissue. And the control in this case is not a validation control, but it is um, normal tissue control. And in this case, we typically want to find variations that are specific to the tumor data. So as a control, we set this up. We say, well, this is normal. We want to subtract out the normal variations observed in um, the sample to find variations that only occur and are, are tumor specific. So, so these are the different workflows. Uh, we're going to start with the validation um, workflow, because that, that one uh, is kind of uh, unique, I think, and, and, and I think that uh, the customers that I've spoken with so far haven't always uh, been aware that there's the ability to do this sort of thing and, and have struggled to really find uh, a way to validate the process other than just having a handful of SNPs they might know. Maybe you want to validate on a larger set to be a little bit more sure about the, about the process. So, so what are these uh, gene panel validation controls? Um, they, they can be used to determine really the uh, effectiveness of the entire workflow, and that includes you know, specificity of the primers, um, especially if you're designing your own uh, workflow um, or your own uh, gene panel. Um, you want to know that the primers or probes that you're using are actually you know, specific to your targets and not grabbing a lot of pseudogenes, for instance, or missing areas. There might be areas that uh, just don't get amplified very well. So you want to um, validate to make sure that you're catching everything. And then you also want to know that, you know that your sequencing instrument is efficient and that our SeqMan engine assembler is uh, accurate and that the SNP calling at the back end, that we're catching all the SNPs, or at least at an acceptable rate that we have uh, acceptable SNP calling. Um, so, so for most customers, uh, it'll be a list, a much smaller list um, of known variations, maybe just from a handful of genes, and that's okay. Um, but we'd like to have, you know, ideally you'd have a bigger data set that has thousands or millions of SNPs so that when you make an adjustment, you know, make something a little bit more stringent maybe on the assembly, that you know what the implication is on a large data set. And so that's where we're going to look at uh, the gentleman in a bottle data set here that, um, uh, in a little bit more detail to show how we can use a larger data set like this to really validate this process. So what is the genome in a bottle um, this is uh, over at NIST. Uh, Justin Zook is the author of this. Um, and it is a human genome. Uh, you might recognize NA12878, a Central European female individual. And what they did is they sequenced this individual using solid and ion torrent 454 and nine alumina high seeks. Um, so all different techniques. And then they assembled it with different assemblers. And then they used different SNP calling algorithms right, to find all the SNPs. And then they look for concordance between all the different techniques. And using that, they're able to validate millions of SNPs um, over about 80% of the genome. Right? And so these are SNPs that are validated to a very high degree of confidence. And so we can use that then to um, you know, possibly, uh, you, know, you could design your own gene panel, use NA12878, target that genome, and then, and then determine, do you find all the SNPs that are in your interesting area? or in your targeted area. And so this little schematic here is showing 
for example, human chromosome 1 and the little pink uh, diamonds represent some SNPs. The uh, NIST gold standard is not the whole genome. They couldn't get, it's about 80% they could determine with a really high degree of confidence, which is represented by these red bars. And you may have a gene panel that just has a few genes that intersect with these um, genome in a bottle regions. And so, so what we can do is use these um, regions in the gene panel to validate the process. So if you find, for instance, all the SNPs in NA12878 in these intersected areas, and it's at 99.5%, you're, you're, you're confident that your process is, is accurate. And so it's a, it's a great resource. We'll have more uh, uh, information about this um, on, our, uh, on our website. We also have, I'm going to jump out of the PowerPoint here. We've started a small uh, white paper. And I don't want those annotations. There we go. And I know Jackie has been working on this. And so we have a, a, a white paper that is uh, that we uh, made available with this release. And uh, this is going to expand, so we're going to have a lot more information here. So we've used this uh, um, gold standard then to really validate our process as well and to, to fine-tune our software. And by using this, uh, this genome, um, we can, uh, there's multiple different data sets, exome data sets, targeted resequencing, whole genome data sets for NA12878. We can run our assemblies with uh, SeqMan Engine, um, uh, try different parameters, try different SNP calling parameters, and you know, come up with some reporting then on you know, the accuracy of, of our, our software. And so I'm just kind of scrolling down here. Uh, and this is a PDF that's available to you if you'd like to look at it. And just to show you what some of the results on accuracy are, um, the, uh, the sensitivity and specificity with Illumina data were you know, well over 99% and a balanced accuracy of 99.8. And with Ion Torrent, um, the specificity is over 99. Accuracy is a little bit lower, um, but still you know, almost 99%. So, and of course, this is looking over a really large data set with thousands in an exome. It's thousands of SNPs. Um, so, of course, our, our job now is to look at this 0.2% and figure out, well, what, you know, why do we miss 0.2%? So we'll continue to fine-tune this and find, you know, those unusual cases, you know, f uh, you know, that might be missed, and we can continue to improve using this nice standard. Uh, and ion torrent as well, uh, we can reduce the false positive rate, and we'll see this number go up here pretty quickly. Um, so again, this is a PDF that you are welcome to. We can send this to you if you'd like to read about how we do the validation. Again, another important thing is all this data is public. So um, this isn't you know, uh, proprietary data that you don't have access to. You can get a demo, try it out yourself, and confirm that, yes, you know, the software is performing at this, at this level. So I'm going to show you, uh, now we're going to go to SeqMan Engine. And I, I just want to show you how we set up and how the interface has changed so that we can run uh, this kind of a validation. And so again, the SeqMan engine, uh, this is the assembly uh, portion of our genomic suite. It's a 64-bit program. It runs on Mac, PC, and Linux. Um, so, so you'll need a little bit more powerful computer. You, know, you want to make sure you have enough disk space to handle the temp files. So the hardware requirement slide that I showed earlier in the PowerPoint is mostly referring to SeqMan engine. Um, once you have the assembly run, you can do the analysis you know, an ArrayStar or SeqMan Pro on, on your regular laptop or desktop computer. So we're going to start by creating a new assembly project. And now our project types, uh, for those of you that are familiar with, with this software, you can see uh, we have a couple new workflows. And we distinguish between a Mendelian and a cancer or somatic gene panel assembly. And the difference is primarily uh, in that the SNP calling um, we're expecting SNPs in different ratios, right? So it'll start to set different defaults depending on what the expectation is with, with, uh, with the variants that are observed. So we're going to stick with a, a germline gene panel. And I could run one without a control or with a control. In this case, we have a validation control that we'd like to run. So I pick with control, name the project, pick an output folder, Again, temporary file location. So if you're doing this on a laptop, you want to make sure, you know, click on the link. You want to make sure that you've got enough disk space for the temp files. And that's just the one thing you really uh, want to uh, um, keep in mind um, as you're doing these assemblies. So a terabyte, 
is probably where the minimum that I would go with with a gene panel, so somewhere in that range. Uh, then we load the uh, template file. So this is what do you want to align against? Uh, DNA Star has been making uh, genome template packages available to customers. So a genome template package contains lots of very useful information. So this is another uh, big decision that you need to make while you do gene panels. I know that many customers, um, instead of using whole genomes, they're using uh, individual cDNA sequences or mRNA sequences. Uh, which is which makes for a faster assembly sometimes, and you don't need as much hardware to assemble it. But you have to understand that if you have a whole genome, there's a lot of advantages. You can have things like dbSNP, which contains all the SNP information from dbSNP, which is in whole genome coordinates. When you when you use a package, a genome template package, you get all the dbSNP information for your analysis. If you use just a cDNA sequence, you're not going to have access to all this information. Also, Cosmic Cancer Database and GERP Evolutionary Rate Profiling Databases are bundled together in these genome template packages with the, chromo with the fully annotated chromosome sequences. And so there's a big advantage to having a little bit more computing power to align your data to a whole genome. Uh, we can also do things like find nonspecific alignment. So if your targeting is not 100% um, specific, if you align to the whole genome, you can see where those other reads have aligned. So it's a great, it's, it's really a, a, a useful thing to have. And you can see that uh, there's a number of genome template packages. Uh, these have been updated recently to have the most current version of DB, uh, DB SNP, and you can just download these from, from the website. Okay, so we load in our genome template package. Um, if you want to include alternate things like the HLA sequences and some of the um, fragments that cannot be uniquely placed in the genome, you can. I usually deselect that because it's pretty rare when I look at those. Um, the targeted regions file, so this is new for version 12, and this is again the manifest or bed file. So um, if you have one, you know, browse to it, load it in, and uh, that will, uh, we'll use that downstream. Uh, then we can load our uh, sequence files. Again, from this pull down, we can select our read technologies. Uh, and we can load uh, multiple projects or just have a single project. Uh, in a control, I could, run, I could run a validation control plus my samples at one time. Um, so the interface supports that. And what it will do is run multiple samples and create separate projects. So we'll have a validation project and we'll have all our samples. When I load the data in, I need to name the data. So I name the experiment so that the software knows how to group the, uh, the data t t together. So that's, that's one and how to name it. So right now I've just set up NA12878 as a, uh, my validation control. And now we have a new screen, and this is uh, really setting up the experiment. So it's going to ask us to specify which of the data sets is the control, and then what type of control, and what list of known variations do I want to associate with the control, do I want to compare against to get my accuracy measurements. And so I can select, in this case, a simple example. It's just the control. So yes, it's the control. What type of control? It is a validation. Uh, and then it says, then I have to set the VCF file. It won't let me proceed. I must have a VCF. So it has to validate against some known standard here. So I have to load in the VCF file. And, and then it asks me, Again, if I have multiple experiments, I may have one VCF for my validation and one a different one for my for my experiments. But in this case, it's just for the validation. Okay, and then I'm so that's a, a new screen that we added to support um, the idea of having controls. Uh, then we go back to assembly options, and there's a number of uh, options here and a couple of changes too between version 11 and 12. Uh, one is deployed. We we give the haploid and diploid and heterogeneous option. So if it's a cancer workflow, heterogeneous will be selected, right? Because the SNP might occur at 1% or 2% or 5% or something like that. Uh, we also have uh, some default um, SNP filtering. So for example, if you have a targeted regions file, a bed file, um, it will automatically say, well, we're just going to apply the SNP filter um, to only show SNPs in those targeted areas. And so, uh, and of course, all this is, is, is uh, if you have questions on these options, the help 
is contextual. So you can select help, and it'll show the screen that you're looking at and define what the different terms are and what these different filters mean, you know, high, medium, and low, what's actually being filtered. Then the assembly is ready to begin. Um, and so I'd run the assembly. Uh, when I align to a human genome, another thing I want to uh, just kind of reiterate is the first time I do that alignment to a human genome, uh, it's the most demanding in the sense that it has to process the human genome sequence and make a temporary, it's called a MER file. Um, so that, that first assembly will take the longest. When I run the assembly again to that same human genome, um, that MER file is left behind, so I can run the second assembly much more quickly. And it can just take just a few minutes then to run these downstream assemblies. So it's uh, one thing to keep in mind as you, as you, if you look at demos and do your assemblies is, is uh, it'll, it'll be a lot faster um, after that first run. Um, when you click Assemble, you can watch this log stream through. Um, if there's any errors here, you can send those to us and we can help you out with them. You can also save out the script and the log. Um, and when it's done, uh, there's going to be some options for you. And I'm just going to describe what they are. It's a screen like this. And I can open the project then um, in, in two different places. I can open it in Seekman Pro if I want to look at the assembled data and run a SNP report and go and look at the reads. Um, or if I have multiple samples that I want to compare, I can load them into ArrayStar. And ArrayStar allows me to compare you know, multiple samples to each other. Um, we'll also have a validation button. And when we click the validation button, that's going to use this validation control and calculate our accuracy measurements across all those SNPs in the validation VCF file. And so that's new interface. Um, it, it, it's transient, though. It's like I'd have to run the assembly to actually show that to you. So I'm just, I'm just describing it here. Um, so we have, have those buttons uh, to do that. Um, so doing a validation control, when I click Validate, it automatically launches ArrayStar, loads the project in ArrayStar, and gives me a text file validation report. And I can show you what that looks like here. So I just say, had saved this out as a text file. And there's, there's a lot of stuff here. It describes um, you know, the number of, of um, SNPs that are in the VCF file and, and uh, the number of true positives and false positives. True positives, false positives. So we see we have a little over 15,000 true positives, 622 false positives, some false negatives. And from those raw numbers, we can uh, calculate things like false positive uh, discovery rate and sensitivity and specificity and balanced accuracy. And so this describes the formula for coming up to those uh, um, calculations. And you can see here in this uh, data set, it's 99.8% um, accurate. And there's also a summary statement here that's very useful. You know, given a minimum, minimum, minimum depth of coverage of 10, 15,494 out of 15,545 were found at a certain p-value. And then some of these had zero coverage. So some of the missed SNPs were actually because there wasn't coverage in those areas. So that's a good thing to look at. So I'd want to know, you know, why, why are some SNPs missed? And so some of them just fell below the depth of 10, 2,000 of them. You know, and 864 had zero coverage. So you could go back and say, well, maybe I have to rethink some of the targets and some of the exons if I'm missing some of them. And we can go back and, and look at those. Um, but overall, the accuracy, uh, you know, so this is a big data set with 15,000 SNPs. And this is a grid. I won't go through all the details, but it's what is the accuracy at different depths of, of SNP coverage and P not ref, which is probability. And you can see that thinner coverage, of course, the accuracy is a little bit lower in the 97s. And when we get to deeper coverage, once we start hitting about, you know, even 20x coverage, we're well in the, even 10x into the 99 uh, percent accuracy. So this is a, again, this is auto-generated. You just set up the assembly, hit the button, it gives you this report. So it's it's pretty pretty useful. Okay, so that's that's kind of the validation workflow, and I could run it on its own, like I did here, or with uh, a data set. So if if I go back. You know, I might say that you know this was you know, just a regular workflow, and I can run my assembly and open it up. And I'm just going to go into a TrueSeq Cancer Panel assembly now, 
And so what you'll see is uh, two windows, as you always do with Seekman when you first open it. And there's been a couple changes here. One is that the report file here has been cleaned up a lot. It's a lot easier to read now. Um, before it was a lot of computer ease and difficult to read, but now you know we can pretty clearly see when when we're, when did we assemble, how long long did it take, um, the number of uh, sequences and kind of a breakdown, number of paired sequences and split sequences and so forth. So the number of SNPs that were found, um, user SNPs, which are the SNPs in the VCF file, how many of those were found in the data set, um, and SNPs that weren't located, but there was coverage. So um, this missing SNP with coverage means there are 66 regions where a SNP was annotated in a VCF file, but and um, but it wasn't called a SNP. There's no variance there. So we get some a little bit more detailed information in the report. And now I can also launch a SNP report. And the SNP report also has changed. So the SNP report, of course, we keep adding more and more things. Uh, and so we found that we're having too many filters up in the header. So we created a filter window. And the filter window then, just a button, and it gives us a free-floating window that allows us to apply uh, pretty much the same filters as before, but it's organized in a more concise manner, and it's consistent with our ARRAYSTAR filters. And so I can apply uh, you know, multiple different filters. Um, one of the new ones that is uh, that very useful is the in-targeted regions only. So if I deselect, it's on by default. Uh, if I deselect it, I may get more SNPs, or I, or I might not. So it's it's uh, depends on the target. On some targets, um, uh, targeting uh, panel uh, uh, data sets, uh, this can eliminate 90% of the SNPs can be just outside that area. Um, with version 12, though, what we've done is you notice that these fields, now I didn't adjust these. If you've seen webinars that I've done in the past, um, Seekman would always start with almost no filtering applied whatsoever. And so the user really had to decide, well, what's my minimum percent and what's my minimum depth? And so you had to you start with a big number and you applied filters and whittled it down to a smaller number. With a gene panel, now that we know what the customer is looking for, we know it's in a targeted area, and we know it's Mendelian versus cancer. We can apply some reasonable filters. And so when you open the project up, um, you know, in this case, these are 25 SNPs, and these are probably the 25 SNPs that I'm going to be interested in. So we have a much better chance of having. Um, the SNPs that you're actually interested in now appear in this SNP table than we did before. Uh, we can also um, adjust this column, and so depending on which rows of information or columns of information you're interested in, you can turn them on or off. So I have a few of them turned off that I didn't plan on discussing. Um, but I think these are mostly the same. There's a, a few changes here. Um, one really nice change, it's not a great example in this data set, but if you go way to the left, you see this, I call them twisty triangles. And when I click the twisty triangle, it expands. And what I'm expanding is when we now have multiple base pair insertions and deletions, um, they're visible in the SNP report and they're coalesced. Um, in the past, they would show up as separate rows, so you just see kind of a string of insertions or deletions in the SNP report and kind of deduce that, oh, that's probably a four base pair deletion or insertion. Um, now the program recognizes those automatically, coalesces them, and calls this, you know, for instance, a two-base pair deletion. And you can expand that and look at each individual reference position. So that's a really nice, um, uh, nice addition. Um, also, under the hood, what we can't uh, really see here is the algorithm used to detect insertion deletions has, has been dramatically improved. So the accuracy. Um, of detecting small indels is is much much higher, and in fact, the the accuracy, our balanced accuracy that we looked at in the validation, that actually includes SNPs and small indels. So, so this accuracy rate includes um, these indels that can be fairly difficult to detect uh, in some cases. So, so you know, it's been a, a dramatic improvement there in, in this accuracy here. Um, so we go through the, some columns here. So that's the coalescing of small indels is new. I'm um, just going to scroll here a little bit, and we can see that we have uh, uh, DB SNP and cosmic entries here, a region capture. So yes, all these SNPs are in our capture region. Um, we have the user ID. So the user ID now is 
the SNPs that are in the VCF file. So we supply this to the VCF and we get just the numerical order essentially of what they are in that file. Uh, and then there's been some minor changes to DNA and, uh, change and amino acid change reporting as well. So it's, a, it's a, I think, a much more useful SNP report. Um, there's also another tab up here, and it's called Missing SNPs, which is uh, kind of a, a misnomer to have a missing SNP. But what, what, what it is, these are positions that were listed in dbSNP or the VCF file where a, a, a variant was not recorded. So Seekman Engine keeps track of the information at each one of these positions. And it writes down information to the assembly file saying, uh, SNP wasn't found here because either there was no variation or there was no coverage at all. And so when you're doing multiple sample uh, uh, comparisons, if I've got 100 samples and I have SNPs in some sna samples but not the others, I need to know why I didn't find SNPs in the others. I need to know that there was no variance, so there was no coverage, rather than just uh, missing information. So we keep track of this information. Um, it's also very useful to look at what was missed and to see, well, why why was it missed? So in this case, I, I sort, and I see there's one SNP here that was in dbSNP at 23%. You know, maybe I decide to investigate that and go and look. It looks like there's like a, you know, was there a homopolymer? It looks like a little bit of homopolymer noise there, maybe. You know, so you can go and interrogate and figure out why individual. Here's a user SNP at 16.9%. You know, and I might go and look and see. So it's a, a nice way to uh, do that kind of analysis, again, in more of a validation of my process. You know, am I catching all the SNPs? And if I'm missing some, what's the reason that I'm missing some of them? So SNP report is a great tool there. There's also um, another tool, and that is the uh, show the coverage of the targeted regions. And so this report, again, uses the bed file in the gene panel assembly, and it, it gives me some different bits of information. One, this enrichment report is kind of a summary of the targeting. So I get the total length of the targeted sequence, of, of the reference sequence. So of the human genome, we really only targeted 40 megabases, the number of aligned reads, um, the total number of aligned bases, the coverage at 1x, 10x, 20, 50x, um, insert median. So we get this nice summary. We also get a list of all the targeted areas. And so here's all the exons, and I have it sorted by gene, so we get this rainbow of colors here. Um, and we get the depth and the percent covered, and we can find areas that we miss too. So this is, again, a tool. If you missed a few exons, you can go here. It's interactive, so I can double click and look at the alignment and look at the targeted region. All right, so it's a great tool to figure out what was missed you know, in a gene panel or what has thin coverage even. Then there's also a not targeted. So these are uh, reads and it aligned outside the targeted areas. And uh, so we want to look at those as well. In this, this case, you know, here's a pseudogene. All right, so we go and look at that and say, well, here's some reads that uh, weren't specific to my target. They landed outside in the pseudo. And this one's pretty clean. Um, there are, I've seen custom data sets where the targeting was not very specific, and you get a whole list of pseudogenes here, and then you have to go back and fiddle with the, the primers and probes to get more accurate targeting. So that, again, a great tool for, for, for gene panels. So, so this is, so again, uh, the new SNP filtering, you know, we can apply multiple filters um, and, and really um, uh, uh, narrow down our focus on the targeted areas and find those, those SNPs of interest. Now, if I want to start comparing uh, multiple assemblies, so if I've got multiple samples, or if I have my um, cancer um, data set, we have a little bit different kind of a project set up. So I'm going to um, go back to Seekman Engine, I think. And select a cancer or somatic panel. And I can pick a control. And rename the project. Same template. And so now we can load, and I'm just going to treat this, so we'll call this uh, you know, tumor and normal. 
So now I may have one file. I might have five files. Um, but I'm just going to call these two different things here. And so now we get a little bit different interface for the control. I have more than one file, and it asks me which one is the control. In this case, it's the normal tissue, and that's a baseline control. And again, we load a VCF file. And so what will happen now is these will be assembled separately. Um, many of these, uh, you know, when we have two different experiments targeted, they can be extremely deep. These can be thousands of X of coverage. Um, and so we don't want them in one project. Uh, when we get to that kind of depth, thousands or tens of thousands, you really need to have a separate project to avoid any chance that there's some bias in the assembly when we load, you know, when we get to those kind of depths. So we want to get the most accurate possible, assemble them separately. And again, it's just the, the same. And at the end here, so we have two data sets, we'll have the option um, open in Seekman Pro. And that will allow us to look at the tumor data set or the uh, normal data set separately in an assembly, or launch an array star. And so and that's where, with this kind of a workflow, going to array star to compare the two sets to each other is going to be the, probably the best option. Again, there's going to be a button that just says open an array star. And I'm just going to go to array star here. And so array star will look something, something like this when you open it. And so we'll have you know, a control or a tumor. Um, we can also, you know, bring in additional experiments. So if I have more data that I want to bring in, it warns me it's often start, you know, better to start new. Um, so I can also assemble it and then and save my project files out and then load them into Arraystar at a later time. So so you can e either use the integration that we have put in or or use them separately. So when I have multiple conditions like this, um, the first place that we usually look is the SNP table. And so the SNP table in ArrayStar really becomes a summary table of, of uh, the two projects. And so we have the chromosome number, the position, the gene name. Here's the control data set, the tumor data set. And all the other columns to the, to the right are columns that I this, um, optionally made visible using this little ABC button. And when you f if you do not import any uh, annotation information, there really isn't much more you can show. Maybe the amino acid change, I think, um, maybe cosmic ID. Um, other things like clinical association and minor allele frequencies and observed genotypes, this is information that I brought in using a VCF file. So like I mentioned earlier in, in uh, the presentation, um, a RayStar can also bring in a VCF file, but it treats it like an annotation file. So I can go and, um, let's see here. Um, I don't have a shortcut on this computer, so I'm going to go up in, to my network. And so we have VCF files from the Exome variant server, for instance. And there's also a thousand genomes database. These are gigantic uh, VCF files. I, I typically like the exome. And you can see there's uh, VCF files then for different chromosomes. So I can select it, open it, and import it into my project. So I've done, I've done that already. Um, and it gives me these additional fields. And once you import, what it's doing is it's assigning annotation information with this reference position in the human genome. So you have to make sure that you know you're using the same versions of the human genome, for instance. Um, but that's uh, um, usually not too difficult these days. But if I go to the ABC, um, these are all different fields that I can make visible in my SNP table, right? And so under A, we've got you know amino acid change. Here's where we get the clinical association. Maybe I want the cDNA position. Um, and if I look at it and say, well, I don't really use that kind of a coordinate, I can remove the column. So you can populate this SNP table then. And you can see all this. Uh, there's, and I don't know what all the, all the different functionalities are, but there's GURPS, Grantham scores, minor allele frequency. So you can use that then to um, load up whatever information you think would be useful for, for your analysis. And once you've loaded the information in, then, of course, you can start filtering. And it's really the filtering now that you're going to – you know, we have 4,980 SNPs here. We want to narrow this down pretty quickly. 
And so we can start applying filters and creating SNP sets. So I can apply a filter, for example, um, on my tumor group and say find SNPs that are in the tumor sample that are non-synonymous, right, and that also are in my VCF file. So I can search, and I get 171 SNPs that meet that criteria. I can click this button and remember them as a SNP set. And then I can do the same kind of search for my control, all right, and then do a search. And I get 117. And I can save that, you know, as my control SNPs that met that same SNP criteria. And so, so again, the interface here, I can also search by some of those terms that we brought in um, in the annotations, too. So I could go through and search for OMIM, for instance, or some other specific terms. I think OMIM comes up here. And, you know, I could, so 20 of the SNPs that are in that SNP table through the clinical association had OMIM, an OMIM link. And I can probably, I'm scrolling way over here to clinical association, and here's the OMIM links then where some of those SNPs had some known clinical association. So, again, ArrayStar is really designed to do advanced filtering, and the goal is to create a subset um, that you can then compare the different sets. And in this case, control tumor, I create a couple of uh, sets, control and tumor. And now I can, you know, in this case, I want to subtract out the normal variations from the normal cells and see what's left over. And of course, a Venn diagram is a great spot to do that. Um, and so I can do a Venn, and you can see now we've got, you know, 62 SNPs that are specific to the tumor sample. I can select that region. And now that here's a, a really important part of array star is I can move from SNP level, base pair level analysis, over to uh, a gene level analysis. So I might be interested now, well, what genes are affected here? We found these 62 SNPs specific to the tumor sample. Um, and there's uh, some um, hot links here that says show the table of genes that contain those SNPs. OK, so, so now I am showing a gene table. Um, there are ways, this, this little button up here allows me to say, show only the selected genes, right? So I just have 45 genes now that I, that I may be interested in. Now you notice a lot of columns of information here. Um, when you first do this, you won't have all this information. So I populated this SNP table as well. So ArrayStar has a great capability for pulling in gene level annotation information from um, different databases. And it just uses the gene name to assign this information. So one place to do this is to just download annotations. And these are, um, uh, Arrays are automatically links with these databases. So for human, it's the Go Consortium. So you can download it and import it into the project. So you get all the Go terms and, the, and, and uh, terms that can be used for ontology comparison. So that's one place to go. Uh, another place is to import um, other databases. And so uh, we've added some capability to include DBNSFP, so clinically relevant genes. So, so that's so we can parse DBNFSP as well. Um, and I think I, I've already done this, but I'll just show you where it's. Uh, uh, so here's a DBNSFP database that I have on my computer. So I can import this into my project as well. And other databases, if you have one that is in TAD delimited text format and it's got a unique gene identifier, there are wizards here that allow us to import that data in. And so, so that's how I've populated my gene table. And you can see, you know, for this subset, we get, you know, a column of disease description, functional description, um, go terms, um, the reference seek ID, trade association. So, and again, under the ABC button here, um, there's all different fields I could pull into this um, gene table to facilitate my analysis. And again, that's not specific to gene panels, um, but we have expanded this capability. And it's something we'll continue to expand. So we've been working to pull in more databases and auto-link with more of them. Um, and of course, once you're at this level, then you can do you know things like gene ontology and other types of analyses. Okay, so with that, we're getting close to the top of the hour here. Um, I'd be happy to take questions. Um, Jackie, is there any questions out there? Yeah, um, one question we had um, 
in considering these gene panels here, what is a reasonable number of or set of SNPs that you should be looking at for these particular workflows? Uh, yeah, so the SNP, the SNP number can vary tremendously. So, you know, for, so for example, the biggest panel is an exome. So an exome can, you know, easily have, um, if you limit to the targeted areas, 15 to 30,000 SNPs can occur in an exome. When we're looking at panels, though, uh, that are cancer panels or, you know, a handful of, relative handful of genes, 100 genes or, or, or less, it's usually a couple of dozen SNPs somewhere in that range. So it's not, not, not a huge number. Sure, sounds good. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions left, but they're they're more technical and project based. So we'll follow up with those people after the webinar here. Um, you can continue to chat in your questions as we wrap up here, and we can respond to you uh, after the webinar with a you know detailed follow up there. Uh, if you think of any other questions later, you can also email me at webinars at dnastar.com or tweet at DNA Star Inc. Uh, also, feel free to email me with any ideas or requests for future webinar topics. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. We hope you found the webinar helpful. Uh, we do have a large collection of videos on our website, as Matt pointed out earlier, so I'd encourage you to check those out when you have some time. Uh, additionally, we also offer fully functional free trials of LaserGene 12, um, so you can do any of these workflows you saw today. Uh, you can easily download those uh, from our website. Our next webinar will be presented uh, by DNA Star's Aaron Reynolds on July 23rd. You can register for this webinar as well as watch recordings of any of our past webinars on our webinars page. Uh, thanks again for joining us and have a great day.